Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. My name is Daniel Belkin, and I'm here with my co-host and brother, Mitch Belkin. We're both medical students interested in non-traditional ideas and innovation. This podcast is our attempt to explore topics currently on the outskirts of medicine, topics not widely accepted by the mainstream, but that we believe merit a closer look. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, follow us on Twitter at exmedpod and sign up for our newsletter at external medicine podcast podcast.com forward slash subscribe. Today, we are interviewing Dr. Stefan Guianet. Dr. Guianet received his PhD in neurobiology and behavior from the University of Washington. Afterward, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the neuroscience of obesity. He is the author of the book, The Hungry Brain, and the founder and director of Red Pen Reviews. He's also a senior researcher at GiveWell. In this interview, we discuss Anthony Sclafani's experiments on food reinforcement and nutrient receptors in the small intestines. We talk about glucagon-like peptide 1, aka GLP-1. We talk about its mechanisms of action with a focus on one GLP-1 agonist in particular, semaglutide. We go over semaglutide's efficacy as a weight loss agent, as well as some of its effects on mood and compulsive behavior. Finally, at the end, we touch on some of the exciting new weight loss drugs that may not only replace semaglutide, but potentially even bariatric surgery as well. Mitch, why is that such a big deal? Daniel, this is huge news. Bariatric surgery is the gold standard for weight loss currently. People can lose 25 to 33% of their body weight. Now, being able to take a drug that could have an equivalent level of weight loss is a total game changer. So let's start off with a bit of background about semaglutide. We don't get into this in the interview, so we want to talk about the step one trial, which was a landmark New England Journal of Medicine trial, which came out in March of 2021. So why don't you tell us, Daniel, what is what does step one stand for? Semaglutide treatment effect in people. And it's, it's one because it was the first, (laughs) they, they just kept going. So the step one is a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial that enrolled almost 2000 non-diabetic adults with either a BMI over 30 or a slightly lower BMI. If they had weight related comorbidities like hypertension dyslipidemia, or obstructive sleep apnea. Then they randomly assigned the participants in a two-to-one ratio for 68 weeks of treatment and gave them either a once-weekly subcutaneous injection of semaglutide or placebo. And then they also gave each group some lifestyle intervention because why not? So um, what were the results of the trial? So people in the semaglutide group lost 15% of their body weight, and the people in the placebo group lost about 2.5% of their body weight. And just for context, this study defines success as a weight loss of 5% body weight or greater. Participants who received semaglutide had greater improvement with respect to cardiometabolic risk factors like lower blood pressure, reduced hemoglobin A1C and lipid levels. Semaglutide also improved physical functioning as assessed by the SF36 and the IWQOL light CT. Dude, why, I don't know what why, those are. Why, why did you even mention that? Well, We're that's just, what it was written in the study. I just want people to know what was in the study. So you're just going to read off a string of letters and numbers because that's what it said in the study? I'm not reading them, dude. I memorized them. <laughs> <laughs> is that what we're doing here? We're just memorizing this stuff. Is, and this is, yeah, this is yeah. what medical school trains us to do. Mitch, why don't you tell us about the strengths and limitations of the trial? So some of the strengths of this trial were that it was a relatively large sample size and had high rates of adherence to the treatment regimen. Some of the limitations included that it was a predominantly white population, about 75% of the participants were white, and also had a relatively large percentage of women. It was 
76% female. So what that means is this data may not be as generalizable to other populations. It was also a relatively short trial at only 68 weeks. And the trial excluded people with type 2 diabetes who represent a large percentage of people who are obese. Furthermore, the participants who actually were enrolled in this trial are likely more committed to weight loss efforts than the general population. And now we bring you Dr. Stefan Guiené. Okay, we're here with Dr. Stefan Guiené. Thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. Welcome. Okay, my pleasure. So before we get started, do you have any financial disclosures? I don't have anything to disclose related to this topic, no. Excellent. So our first question is, to somebody who's not familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in your current research? I received a BS in biochemistry at the University of Virginia and always had the idea that I was going to um, go into neuroscience, and that's what I did for grad school. I um, got a PhD in neurobiology and behavior at the University of Washington. At the time, I was studying neurodegenerative disease, and um, I was studying a rather rare neurodegenerative disease, and I wanted to work on a topic that was more impactful. And I've always been interested in health and nutrition. And so it was a natural transition for me to move to do a postdoc in the um, neuroscience of obesity. So working with Mike Schwartz and trying to understand how the regulatory systems in the brain that regulate body fatness and energy intake are altered in obesity. And uh, from there, I uh, decided not to pursue a career in academia, but I've continued, um, I've continued following the literature in these areas and continued with public communication in these areas, including writing my book, The Hungry Brain, which is about the neuroscience of overeating and obesity and uh, other various contributions that I've made, including a recent article in works in progress on um, the future of weight loss. Yeah, we read that. We really liked it. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but I, I saw that you are a senior fellow at GiveWell. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. The titles have changed around a little bit. So now I'm a senior researcher, but yeah, that is correct. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do for them? I'm a huge GiveWell fan. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am a... Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a general purpose researcher on the research team. Currently, I'm leading an investigation into water quality interventions in low-income countries, so building uh, cost-effectiveness analysis to figure out how much good it does to clean up water in places with unsafe water, such as uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm also working on building a cost-effectiveness analysis for malnutrition treatment. So children who have severe acute malnutrition or moderate acute malnutrition in low-income settings with high infectious disease burden and um, suboptimal nutrition, how much good does it do to come in and uh, provide treatment to these children? And when I say how much good does it do, obviously these are very beneficial interventions, um, but really what we try to do is determine how good is the cost effectiveness of these interventions relative to all the other places that you could put your money. And so, um, yeah, so those are two of the big things I'm working on for them right now. So essentially, I do a lot of uh, research into what the interventions are, what the evidence is that underlies their effectiveness, and then build cost effectiveness models based on that and, and other factors. Very cool. You also have a number of other projects going, including Red Pen Reviews. Can you tell us what is Red Pen Reviews and what is it that you're doing with that project? Yeah, so Red Pen Reviews is my response and our team's response to our perception that there is just a lot of low quality nutrition information in the public sphere. So essentially you have... Uh, 
there's no disincentive. There's very little disincentive to making wild claims about nutrition in the public sphere. And, and the reason for that is that there's no, um, there's no accountability for making those claims. So the people judging that information aren't necessarily knowledgeable about it. So there's no accountability. And so what we do is we publish expert reviews of popular nutrition books. And um, in order to do that, we developed a structured semi-quantitative review method that um, is totally unique and that allows us to numerically rate these books in in a, a structured um, consistent manner and so by doing that we can we create the most informative most consistent and uh, most unbiased reviews of popular nutrition books that are available and you can go onto our website all the reviews are available for free and you can see the review score summarized at the top so literally in 10 seconds you can have a, uh, a very good idea of whether a book is worth reading and you can have a sense of how scientific it is, how good the health information in it, in it is, and how uh, accurately it uses citations. And you can take those numbers and you can compare them across any book that we've reviewed. So if you wanted to say, what's the best book that's been reviewed on topic X, you can look for the one that's received the best score. Um, so it's really a uh, kind of a reimagining of what you can do with a book review and how you create an incentive structure for the nutrition publishing industry. So what is the most accurate <laughs> uh, book out there on nutrition that you have reviewed so far? Yeah. So the one that has scored the best thus far is titled Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy by Walter Willett. Well, I guess I'll have to go check that out. <laughs> All right. You mention Anthony Sclafani frequently. Uh, he's not someone who I think most people are familiar with. So why is he so important? And uh, if you could tell us a little bit about his interesting experiments. Yeah. So Anthony, Anthony Sclafani is someone who he's, he's a researcher, a uh, physiology researcher who has done a lot of the fundamental research identifying how food reward works. So in other words, how does food link up with the motivational processes in our brain that cause us to be motivated to eat certain types of food more than others? And um, there's a few different things that he's done in, in this field that are notable, but I would say the one that comes to mind first is that he developed this method for very cleanly assessing the rewarding properties of different food substances. And so uh, when I say rewarding, I'm talking about reinforcing. So the food substances that cause animals to develop uh, that basically stimulate dopamine release and cause them to be motivated to seek foods that have those substances in them. So like, okay, I'm, I'm being kind of confusing here, but let me, let me give you drugs as an, as a cleaner, simpler analogy. So you take uh, crack cocaine, it causes dopamine to go up in your brain and that causes you to be more likely to uh, seek cocaine and take it in the future. And it increases the intensity of your behaviors related to seeking and taking cocaine. That's called reinforcement. So how does that work? That's how does that work for food? Because these circuits in your brain that cocaine acts on, they didn't evolve for cocaine seeking, they evolved for food seeking and sex seeking and, and other natural rewards. And so, um, he developed this really clean process for understanding how that works for different food substances. And what he does is he infuses different substances directly into the stomach or the upper small intestine or different areas of the intestine. And at the same time, simultaneously infuses flavor into the mouth of the animal. And so and then later on, he determines whether the animal has uh, developed a preference for that flavor 
above other potential flavors that that the animal is exposed to. So they put bottles in their cages with different flavors and they say, did this animal develop a preference for the flavor that was paired with this nutrient infusion directly into its gut? And this is like, you can think of this, if you're familiar with Pavlov's dog experiments, he found that the dogs, when he rang a bell at the same time that he fed them, they came to associate the sound of the bell with the receipt of food and they would salivate at the sound of the bell alone. So this is called Pavlovian conditioning. And it is where your brain basically makes a link between some previously neutral stimulus, in this case, the bell or the flavor, and some innately rewarding substance, the, the food that Pavlov fed the dogs or the you know substance that Sclafani infused into the gut. And so basically he used this method that he developed to determine where this reinforcement occurs in the body and what substances cause it. And what he determined is that most of this reinforce, excuse me, most of this reinforcement occurs in the upper small intestine. So there are receptors in the upper small intestine. Now we know a lot more about how this works than uh, because others have built on his work, but we know that there are receptors in the upper small intestine that detect nutrients, particularly they detect carbohydrates, especially glucose. They detect fatty acids. They detect amino acids. And then there may be other ones that detect things like uh, salt and, and glutamate, which is that umami flavor. And once they detect those things, they send a signal up nerves that connect the uh, small intestine to the brain, particularly the vagus nerve is the one that's carrying the signal. And those go to the brainstem. And from the brainstem, they are communicated to dopamine releasing cells in the brain, in the uh, VTA and the uh, substantia nigra that then produce dopamine that mediates reinforcement. So basically when that dopamine hits your brain, whatever sensory stimuli you're experiencing are going to get reinforced. So in this case, dopamine hits the rat's brain. It At that same time, it is experiencing this particular flavor in its mouth. And so that flavor gets reinforced. And so that's how we acquire a taste for foods. And that's how we develop our motivation cravings to prefer certain types of foods over others. And there's less research on this in humans, but there has been some research done by Leanne Birch um, that has successfully used both carbohydrate and fat to cause food reinforcement in humans. Um, and, and you see this in surveys of the types of foods that are associated with cravings and addiction-like behavior. What you see is that the foods that are higher in dopamine-stimulating nutrients, especially combinations, calorie-dense combinations of refined carbohydrates and fats, you find that those are the foods most commonly associated with cravings and uh, addiction-like eating behaviors. People don't get addicted to celery. They don't, you know, they don't crave plain lentils. Um, these are not, those are not foods that have the properties that are strongly reinforcing to the brain and drive this elevated motivational state. It's a very interesting design of an experiment to pair flavors orally with different nutrients. Because in terms of like the way natural selection would work, the senses and the flavors that you're tasting in your mouth are presumably the same ones that would eventually end up in your small intestines. So it's sort of it's sort of interesting. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how you would essentially have taste receptors located in the small intestines. Like it's very strange. Do you have any thoughts on how that could have come to be? Yeah. So essentially you have two levels of information gathering. I mean, there's many levels, but you could break it down broadly into two levels. One is the level of prediction of what the nutrient content of the food is. And that's what you're mouth is doing. That's what your nose is doing. That's what your eyes are doing. 
when you're looking at food and smelling it and tasting it. But by the time it gets into your small intestine, what that's doing is measuring what the actual nutrient content is. So it's not just predicting based on your past experience with that food. So like, you know, when you see a slice of pizza, your brain, you've eaten pizza before, your brain already knows what's in it. And so you have a predictive, uh, you, you can make a prediction about what that is that's very fast before you even consume it. However, once it actually gets into your small intestine and it's getting broken down, then you have nutrient sensors that are saying, okay, what's actually in this? And did what we thought, you know, what we thought was in this food, is that actually what we got out of it? And then you can get a, what's called a reward prediction error that updates your brain on the value of that food. Very interesting. So we want to talk for some time about semaglutide specifically with respect to a number of recent trials on them. But before we can talk about semaglutide, I guess we need to talk about GLP-1, what GLP-1 is and how GLP-1 agonists work with respect to um, these sorts of medications like semaglutide. Yeah, absolutely. So GLP-1 is a compound that is produced or it's a hormone that is produced by the intestine when you eat and um it is what's called an incretin hormone and what that means is that it signals to the pancreas to increase insulin secretion in a glucose dependent manner so when you eat a meal and you have uh, glucose blood sugar increasing in your bloodstream and you have the secretion of GLP-1, GLP-1 prods your pancreas to secrete more insulin in, in response to that, um, that glucose. And so originally when this hormone was discovered, the you know, primary application that came to mind was as a diabetes drug because it increases insulin secretion around meals. And that is when extra insulin is particularly useful for a person with diabetes because you know the the problem is it's it's really tough to match insulin injection with insulin need so for someone who has diabetes you know the body is very good at secreting exactly as much insulin as you need to cover your 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 glucose but it's a lot harder to do that by injecting boluses of insulin into your body. And so having this hormone that is already tuned to only help you release insulin right when you need it uh, was, you know, viewed as a, as potentially a very helpful thing. And that turned out to be the case. It was developed initially as a diabetes medication. Um, I'm trying to remember what the, uh, what it was first marketed as, let's see here, Bietta and Bidurion, which is, those were the, that was the first GLP-1 based drug. And it was a synthetic version of the hormone that had a longer, longer half-life. So essentially, instead of having this super short-lived hormone that degrades really fast in the blood, you have this longer lived version of it that can, um, be injected less frequently and, and be effective in, in a clinical setting. Um, however, what they also discovered with GLP-1 is it suppressed food intake in animals. And this effect is um, really differs quite a lot across different um, GLP-1-based drugs. So some drugs suppress food intake a lot and cause a lot of weight loss. Some do not cause very much weight loss and do not suppress food intake very much. Um, however, what was discovered was really interesting is that the impact of these drugs on insulin secretion is mediated entirely by their effects on the body other than the brain. So effects in the pancreas, but their effects on food intake and body weight are mediated entirely by the brain. So you have these two different effects that are that have completely different physiological mechanisms. And it turns out that there are a bunch of GLP-1 receptors in the brain, and 
probably they mostly are not actually responding to hormonally secreted GLP-1 in, in the typical state. So when you're eating food and secreting GLP-1, it's probably not doing much to your brain. However, GLP-1 is also a neurotransmitter in the brain. So it's used by neurons to communicate independently of its incretin hormone effect. And basically, when you inject the right type of GLP-1 analog into the bloodstream, you start stimulating those cells that naturally respond to GLP-1, particularly in the brainstem, but also maybe in the, um, in the hypothalamus. And that is the effect that mediates the um, reduction in food intake and the weight loss that's caused by these drugs. There's there's also the slowing of gastric emptying that's a result of, I mean, these incretins also slow gastric emptying. Does that also contribute to decreases in food intake or is the neural mechanism really the predominant effect? It's It's really the neural mechanism because the gastric emptying effect doesn't last it's transient, whereas the weight loss and reductions in food intake are durable. So could it contribute in the first couple of weeks? Maybe uh, that's possible, but most of the weight is not lost in the first couple of weeks. So um, I think that if it's playing a role, it's it's got to be pretty minor and transient relative to the neurobiological mechanisms. Could you go into just a, a bit more detail? So with the actual GLP-1 agonist is in the bloodstream, it's crossing the blood-brain barrier, it's getting into the brainstem, it's going into the hypothalamus. Like this, what is it signaling? Is it also through the ventral, uh, the VTA and the um, sort of dopaminergic neurons in the striatum, or is it a different mechanism that's actually leading to reduction in appetite? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um I wish I remembered more clearly. This actually has been, this question has been answered by studies that were conducted by Nova Nordisk. Um, what they did was they injected fluorescently labeled, um, I think it was liraglutide or semaglutide, one of those GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the first thing they did was they saw where does it go in the brain and the second thing they did was they looked at what cell types were activated in response to it. And that includes cell types that are directly activated as well as second cell types that are secondarily activated. So they didn't necessarily themselves see semaglutide, but they were activated by the cells that, that did see semaglutide. And so they've, they've mapped this stuff out in pretty, pretty good detail. And they see activation in the brainstem. They see activation in the hypothalamus, which are two areas that are intimately involved in uh, regulation of eating behavior and body fatness. Um, I don't remember whether they saw activation in the, in the sort of dopamine secreting and dopamine responsive circuits, but it's a good question. So now let's talk a little bit more in detail about semaglutide is it semaglutide is it semaglutide i say semaglutide i th i think i think it's semaglutide all right <laughs> all right we're going to go with semaglutide then so what what makes semaglutide special and why is it possibly a new chapter in the treatment of obesity yeah the thing that makes it special is that it causes a ton of weight loss <laughs> And uh, so if you look at the trials, and it, these are really rigorous trials, you know, these are large uh, phase three randomized controlled placebo controlled trials published in, uh, you know, high quality journals. So this is this is a really high level of evidence we're talking about. And what what they show is that in people assigned to take semaglutide over 68 weeks, you see anywhere between 15 to 18% loss of body weight. And just to put that into perspective, so first of all, that's intent to treat. So not all those people necessarily, not all the people included in that figure were necessarily even on semaglutide by the end of it. There's That includes dropouts. Um, I think if you exclude dropouts, it's more like 18 to 20% weight loss. Um, and that's what 
we're seeing in the clinic, people like David Macklin, who have been treated, treating a lot, you know, over a thousand people over the last couple of years, they report 18 to 20% average weight loss. Um, yeah. And, and these drugs have a really good safety profile too, at least as far as we currently know. So they cause some unpleasant gastrointestinal side effects, particularly early on when you're just starting and just ramping up dosage, those usually go away. And um, most people end up having a really good experience with it. As far as I can tell, like they lose a lot of weight. They feel like they're gaining control of their eating behavior and they are not experiencing ongoing uncomfortable side effects. And then in terms of the more serious side effects, there are a number of large randomized controlled trials that have reported data for semaglutide. And there were some early concerns about pancreatic cancer, about thyroid cancer in, in animal models. None of those have really been borne out by the human data, particularly from randomized controlled trials. And there are tens of thousands of, of people now that we have that have gone through those trials. Um, the evidence is not perfect. You know, these trials, you could argue they, they didn't last long enough to see um, outcomes that might take a long time to manifest, like certain types of cancer outcomes. Um, you could say that they didn't have enough power to identify um, low frequency outcomes like, like thyroid cancer. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not like there is hundred percent certainty of zero risk. However, I think it does look pretty good. And also, um, you have data suggesting that this drug class reduces cardiovascular risk quite substantially. It's on par with statins. You reduce the risk of major cardiovascular events by about a quarter. So that is really good because one of the issues with previous weight loss drugs that ended up failing like FenFen is that they increased cardiovascular risk. Um, so that's a really important piece of evidence. And then if you look at all-cause mortality in people with type 2 diabetes, there's a meta-analysis showing that it's reduced by 12%. So I think so far the safety data are looking really good. And, you know, I, I don't want to, like come across with complete confidence about this. There's of course, you know, we're still learning and I can't say that for certain that there, you know, it will, I can't say for certain that there aren't going to be risks that we don't know about yet. I think it seems pretty unlikely that they're going to be large enough that it's going to get the drug withdrawn, but you never know what could happen. Um, and just to put these weight losses into, into context, Losing 5% of body weight was considered like the threshold to reach using behavioral weight loss interventions like diet and lifestyle. Like you have these really intensive interventions like the diabetes prevention program that hit like 7% weight loss, which was viewed as really good. And then by three years into the intervention, it was down to 4%. And that again, that's good. Like by the standards of diet and weight loss or diet and lifestyle interventions, that is effective. Um, and, you know, you look at the other drugs and most of them are achieving that something in that range of weight loss as well. The drugs that came prior to semaglutide. And then now you have semaglutide that's causing in, in RCTs 15 to 18% loss of body weight. So, I mean, for me, this is, a huge breakthrough. And it's, you know, I just can't overemphasize how effective this is relative to other options that we have right now. The one exception being bariatric surgery, of course, which is incredibly effective. Um, and it's just the beginning. So semaglutide is just, is just the first one in this wave of new therapies that are, that are headed toward us. You mentioned that semaglutide had positive cardiovascular effects. Is that through its effect on diabetes or is that separate? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. It, um, 
I don't know whether it's related to effects on diabetes. However, it is independent of the effect on weight loss, surprisingly, or at least it's not dependent on that, I should say. So there are drugs in this class of GLP-1 receptor agonists that do not cause significant weight loss, and yet they still have a cardiovascular benefit. So it seems to be via mechanisms that are not entirely dependent on weight loss. Interesting. And you mentioned bariatric surgery is also one of the most effective ways to lose weight. Uh, do you remember what percent weight loss you get when you do that? Is it like 20%? More than that. Typical would be you would get somewhere between a third and a quarter loss of body weight. So somewhere in the 30, 25 to 33% range. If you look at studies where they do the surgery and then follow people up for a few years, it's usually in the, in the range of a quarter. And and I'm, I'm referring specifically to the more common surgery types like ruin Y and vertical sleeve gastrectomy, because there are other versions that are, that are less effective or are more effective in terms of weight loss. But those are like the most common, really effective uh, versions. Prior to semaglutide, you mentioned that there were other weight loss options that existed that were not nearly as effective as this appears to be. What were some of the other options that previously were used? I know we don't need to get into like uh, dinitrophenol or anything like that, but <laughs> more recent than that. So you mean uh, drugs that have regulatory approval? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to look up the list here to so make sure I don't leave anything off. That's important. Um, but, you know, you have uh, w probably the best one that was approved previously was liraglutide, which was another GLP-1 receptor agonist. Liraglutide causes about 7% weight loss, which is kind of on the upper end of what you would see with drugs prior to semaglutide. Um, so you have basically two types of drugs. You have drugs that act in the brain, like... Uh, Contrave, which is naltrexone, bupropione, Qsimia, which is fentramine to pyramate. And then the other class is Orlistat, which uh, Zenical is the, the commercial name for it. And that basically blocks a portion of fat absorption in the gut. So it inhibits an enzyme that, uh, that helps you break down and absorb fat, causing you to fail to absorb about a third of the dietary fat that you eat. And it's not a very effective drug. I mean, it, it does cause weight loss. It actually reduces diabetes. Um, it reduces progression from prediabetes to diabetes quite substantially uh, in randomized controlled trials. But the weight loss effect is, is pretty modest. I mean, most people are not going to achieve 5% loss of weight on that drug. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what the landscape looked like prior to semaglutide and all of those drugs, except for liraglutide really had side effects that most people would consider not to be worth the amount of weight loss that they cause. So a number of the drugs are, or I should say the majority of drugs used for weight loss have central effects and only the uh, Orlistat, is, is that a lipase in um, lipase yeah. that it inhibits? Okay. Mm -hmm. In terms of drugs having activity in the brain and sort of on similar reward circuits, are there any effects on, say, alcohol consumption or compulsive behaviors that you find in patients that are using any of these medications? Yeah, absolutely. You know, with the exception of Orlistat, which has that completely different mechanism, it is actually typical for anti-obesity medications to also have effects on drug use, recreational or drugs of abuse. And uh, so you see that also with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, particularly in uh, animal models, but they're starting to do human studies on this as well. 
you see that these drugs reduce the consumption of alcohol. They reduce the consumption of drugs. Um, like I can't remember which drugs that have been tested, but some of the, you know, harder drugs, harder illegal drugs of abuse. And yeah, so, you know, and, and what you see with the semaglutide anecdotally as well is that people report that they engage in fewer dopamine fueled behaviors across the board. So they're not as interested in drinking alcohol. They're not as interested in taking drugs. They're not as interested in smoking cigarettes. They're not as interested in shopping, which is a pretty interesting one. So I think these, you know, I think this highlights the fact that there's a lot of commonality in the, the mechanisms of, uh, you know, the mechanisms that drive us to eat food and overconsume food in the modern environment and the mechanisms that make us attracted to other highly rewarding stimuli like drugs or, you know, shopping. So since these medications are changing behavior, decreasing drive for alcohol, decreasing shopping behavior, and other sorts of dopaminergic reward behaviors, uh, do patients who take these medications ever have psychiatric problems such as suicidal ideation or depression, depressive type symptoms? Yeah, this is a very pertinent question because this is precisely what sunk Ramanabant, which is a, uh, a weight loss drug that was briefly approved in the European Union, never quite got approved by the FDA. Um, and the issue was, yeah, precisely it increased the risk of psychiatric conditions and suicidal ideation and I don't think it was statistically significant, but there was certainly a trend toward increase in completed suicides as well in the in the trials. Um, yeah, and so you know, if you look at how Ramanabant works, it is an inverse agonist at the cannabinoid type one receptor, and that is the receptor that marijuana activates. So it's basically the opposite of marijuana, and you know, marijuana is something that people take <laughs> to feel good, right? And so what happens when you do the reverse of that, people don't feel good. Um, but essentially, you know, it's, I think it can be challenging. I would speculate, I would speculate that it can be challenging to target reward driven eating behavior, which is one of the primary drivers of overconsumption without targeting other reward driven behaviors and without targeting reward more broadly. And so Ramanabant was not able to thread that needle. And I'm hoping that semaglutide can thread that needle. Right now, there's no evidence that it is causing adverse psychiatric effects. Um, and that is obviously something that has been examined with interest due to the history of Ramanabant, and you can bet the FDA was very cued into that um, when they were reviewing the application by Novo Nordisk for uh, for Wegovy, which is the um, semaglutide preparation that's used for for weight loss. So right now, there's not any evidence of that, but it's something that I'd like to keep my eye on, and you know, even if it's subclinical, like, will these drugs, you know, if they reduce shopping behavior, are they going to start cutting into natural reward behavior that we want to keep? Like, I think most people probably aren't going to be sad to, you know, have less of a drive to shop compulsively or drink alcohol. But, you know, what if people, you know, just don't enjoy eating or don't enjoy like, catching a fish or having sex or, you know, whatever other like natural rewards that we consider to be positive and constructive. I don't know the answer to that question. And that, that's something that I think I'm interested to know more about, but, but I will say right now, you know, what I find reassuring is if you talk to doctors about it, they will tell you that their patients really like being on this drug. 
they get a really good weight loss effect. They feel like they have more control over their food. They feel like they're not having significant negative side effects for the most part. And so like, I feel like if there was a really big problem here, it probably would already be quite apparent. But again, I'm, I'm open to, you know, further evidence on that. I like that your list of activities that people really enjoyed doing was eating and then catching a fish and then having sex. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> so what, from your point of view, having done a lot of research on this, what is, does the future seem to be for weight loss medications? The future looks awesome. So we have semaglutide, which by the way, is very expensive right now in the US wholesale cost of $1,300 a month. Um, and, you know, to be determined how well it's going to be covered by various insurance programs. Um, now it's a lot less expensive in other countries. It's about a quarter of the cost and that's how it goes, uh, for many drugs, which is pretty crazy, but perhaps a topic for another day. And, but you have all these other drugs that are nipping at its heel right now. And that promises to, potentially yield more effective options and also bring the price down on, on Wegovy. So the one that is closest to gaining FDA approval is terzepatide. That one is um, currently under review for diabetes, type 2 diabetes treatment. But this is how these drugs have gone. First, they have, get them approved for type 2 diabetes then they get them approved for obesity. That's how it went for liraglutide and semaglutide. And that's what uh, Eli Lilly is doing for terzepatide. But terzepatide, from what I can tell, looks like it might cause more weight loss than semaglutide. It might be actually a little more effective than semaglutide, both in terms of its effects on diabetes management and its effects on body weight. So there are um, trials. I can't remember if they have um, been initiated yet or not, but there, there are going to be trials published on uh, obesity specifically. And then um, Eli Lilly will presumably apply to the FDA for approval for treatment of obesity as well. Um, but probably even before that, people will be using it off-label. That's what happened with semaglutide. So essentially with semaglutide, you use a higher dose of it for treatment of obesity than you would normally use for treatment of diabetes. And so people were using it off-label at the obesity dose for, for several years before its approval for obesity this year. So I think that's probably going to happen at least to some degree with terzepatide. And, and again, semaglutide, terzepatide, they both look really good. If terzepatide causes a little bit more weight loss, they're both still going to be great options. And the main benefit that I see is that it will force competition in the market and the prices will hopefully go down. Um, and then there's a lot of other stuff happening too. So there was a trial published recently by Nova Nordisk showing this was a phase two trial showing that when you combine um, semaglutide with, what is this stuff called? I'm forgetting the name. All these- Is this, is this amylin? Ridiculous sounding names. Yeah, amylin, um, the amylin analog, cagrillantide. So, okay, cagrillantide, it's, it's an amylin analog. Uh, so amylin is another one of these gut hormones. You have a lot of this innovation in obesity- pharmacology is coming from gut brain axis. So cagrillantide, amylin analog, that's a hormone produced by the pancreas that is also part of this kind of digestive tract brain axis. And um, when you combine semaglutide and cagrillantide over a, let's see, what was it? It was a 20 week trial and, oh, sorry, this was a phase one trial, apologies, I said phase two. Um, over 20 weeks, it almost doubled the weight loss of semaglutide. So when you add this additional drug to semaglutide, it almost doubled the effect size, which is crazy because semaglutide is already causing 18 to 20% weight loss, or I should say 15 to 20. So 
when I saw this, it just blew me away because this was the first time I ever saw the results of a weight loss trial. And I was like, whoa, are these people going to lose too much weight? Is this like going to be unhealthy amount of weight loss? This is just crazy. So we don't know exactly where their weight would, would stabilize because it was only a 20 week trial and they were still very much in free fall. Um, but you know, given the rate of loss, you would expect it to stabilize significantly below where semaglutide alone would leave somebody. So, you know, we're probably looking at maybe 25% loss of body weight, and that puts you on par with bariatric surgery. So this drug combination, it, and it, the side effects look fairly similar to semaglutide alone. You get some more severe gastrointestinal issues, but they haven't seen any serious problems. I don't know whether this drug will gain FDA approval or not, um, but it seems like it might. And, you know, even if it doesn't, this is very significant that we're seeing the result of a randomized controlled trial of, you know, evidently safe pharmacology that's causing as much weight loss as bariatric surgery. So even if this or that I should say that I think will cause as much weight loss of bariatric surgery if you extrapolate the weight loss curves out into the future. And we'll see more from them on that. Um, but I mean, this is very, very significant in my view. And again, that, you know, I'm, I'm just getting started here. There's all these other ones. Um, one that I'm really excited about that I actually didn't write about in the works in progress um, article is so all of these all of these GLP1 based drugs that I've been talking about so far they're all proteins so they are literally modified versions of the actual protein hormones that your body endogenously secretes so they've got some amino acid differences they've got extra side chains but it's at its base it's a protein and a protein creates some pretty significant challenges because proteins are hard to produce they require special facilities. They're expensive to synthesize. And they also, in their native state, they don't survive the trip down your gastrointestinal tract. They get chopped up just like protein from cheese or tofu. And so Nova Nordisk has technology that allows these drugs to be uh, absorbed through the GI tract. So there actually is an oral version of semaglutide, but it's still, you know, it's just still a major, a major hurdle. So what would be better is to have a drug that does the same thing, but that's not a protein. It's a small molecule. So small molecule, more like something like ibuprofen or Tylenol. It's not a, pro, it's not composed of amino acids. It's just its own molecular thing that goes into your body and hits the GLP one receptors. And there actually is a small molecule GLP-1 receptor agonist that's been developed by uh, Pfizer. The drug is called PF0688-2961. So that's uh, an elegant name, but uh, they, they recently published some results from that in people with type two diabetes, and it looks really good. They tweet, they treated them for 28 days. Um, and it caused depending on dose body weight loss of two to 9% and improved their blood glucose control substantially. So, um, small molecule, the advantages would be, it could potentially be a lot cheaper. It could be more shelf stable and it could be more readily orally bioavailable. So you could, produce something that's more like a standard pill that would have the same, in theory, the same kind of effects that semaglutide has. So we're, we're still in, you know, the early stages of this, that was a phase one trial, but it is a proof of principle that that type of pharmacology is, is possible. And so um, that's another exciting development in that sphere. Before we go on to our rapid fire questions, I just wanted to pause on your concerns about people having too much weight loss. Obviously, a drug that can cause people to have reductions of 20, 25% of their body weight could take somebody that is 
obese and potentially bring them down to being normal weight. And if you're taking somebody that's normal weight, you could push them into anorexic territory. So have you done much thinking on the potentials for abuse of these substances? Or is that something that people are actively thinking about? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. It is like totally foreign to me to think that there could be an obesity therapy that would be too effective. Um, given that, you know, by far the main problem is the opposite <laughs> lack of effectiveness. Um, so, you know, honestly, it's no, it's not something I've given a, a whole lot of thought to. Um, it never, you know, it barely even crossed my mind before seeing this trial. And yeah, I mean, if a drug is approved, that has the potential to cause an unhealthy degree of excessive weight loss. I think that is something that will have to be monitored. Uh, you know, that's something that will have to be monitored medically. And it makes me think though, you know, the, the impact of semaglutide is, is quite variable between individuals. So, you know, I gave you the average, but it actually can vary quite a bit between individuals. So, it would be interesting to know if even with semaglutide, if there's a you know small subset of people who lose too much weight, I actually don't know the answer to that question. So uh, now we just have a few rapid fire questions for you. In the last 20 or 30 years, what are one or two studies in the field of nutrition or obesity neuroscience that you think more people should be aware of? I think the diabetes prevention program trial was extremely important. Very large, rigorous, randomized controlled trial showing that a diet and lifestyle intervention could reduce uh, progression from pre-diabetes to type 2 diabetes by 58%. And it wasn't even that, you know, the weight loss wasn't that large. The amount of physical activity they did wasn't that large, but even that relatively modest change greatly reduced the progression to type two diabetes. And so, you know, it does a couple of things. One, it gives us a highly effective tool for preventing type two diabetes. And two, it tells us how type two diabetes works. It gives us an idea of what the mechanism is. So I think that trial is, is really, really important. And I guess I would cite also the STEP trials, which are the semaglutide and obesity trials that were done by Nova Nordisk. Those were the trials that demonstrated the effectiveness of uh, semaglutide for weight loss in, in obesity. And I think those were also really landmark trials. What important medical truth do very few of your colleagues agree with you on? <laughs> I'm going to go real controversial on this one. I think that trans fats are probably not as unhealthy as they've been made out to be. Whoa, that's too controversial for our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did a deep dive on this for uh, Open Philanthropy Project and Give Well. It's not, it hasn't been published, but essentially I went as deep as, as I could into all the evidence that's cited to indict trans fat. And, uh, Essentially, you know, one of the biggest things that stood out to me is in these review papers talking about how bad trans fat is that have been extremely influential. Nobody ever talks about the animal research. There's this whole world of animal research on trans fat that almost uniformly shows that it doesn't have any negative effects. It doesn't cause atherosclerosis. It doesn't, you know, contribute at least the evidence is not strong that it contributes to the metabolic syndrome. It doesn't really seem to do much of anything relative to other fats in animal models. You can look in rodents, you can look in pigs, you can look in uh, prime, non-human primates. The, the big claim of cardiovascular disease is totally unsupported in animal models of cardiovascular disease. And uh, so that that's really the biggest thing that stands out to me, but also if you look at what it does to blood lipids, um, that was that's a major part of the argument is that it uh, increases LDL and decreases HDL. 
and it was kind of the combination of those two that was supposed to be the 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 really bad thing the ldl thing i don't i don't have any issue with that argument i think ldl is just so tightly causally linked to atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease that i think that's a good argument but the hdl piece has really kind of crumbled over the years so you have these um hdl cholesterol in increasing drugs that totally failed cardiovascular trials and you know they either didn't change risk or they even increased risk showing that hdl cholesterol is just not a causal it doesn't have the kind of causal effects that people thought it did the hdl particle itself might still but hdl cholesterol itself is just an epiphenomenon it's not causal and so when you're modifying it via trans fat, what does that mean? I, 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 don't, I don't think it's easy to interpret that in light of what we know about HDL cholesterol. So if, you're not, if you don't care about the HDL cholesterol piece, then all you're looking at is LDL cholesterol, and it has an effect that's similar to saturated fat for LDL, but you eat a lot less of it in the diet. So you know you're talking about a couple percent, a few percent in the diet in, in, you know, before we started getting alarmed about it, that was kind of like what we were eating in the U S so it's quantitatively not very large in the diet and the quantitative impact on blood lipids is not very large. So is it good for you? No, it's, it probably is not good for you. And I, you know, personally avoid it, but I just, I I'm not convinced that it is disproportionately harmful, like more than any natural type of fat is. I could be wrong about that. You know, these are not high certainty conclusions, but um, I just think the evidence is not as strong as, as it's been made out to be. Okay. Uh, last question. What do you think about fasting and its utility in diabetes or obesity and lots of people make claims about its utility when it comes to longevity. Yeah. What do you think about fasting? Yeah, we've actually reviewed these claims pretty extensively in some of our reviews on red pen reviews. Um, so we reviewed Walter Longo's book was it called the longevity diet, I think. And uh, also um, Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code. And those both talk a lot about fasting. And, and basically, it, it reduces weight, it improves metabolic health, but it doesn't have the it doesn't live up to the hype. So if you compare it head to head with standard old fashioned portion control type calorie restriction, it's about the same. So um, that is to say it's helpful, but it's, it's not like this, you know, game changing home run of a, of a method seems to have very similar effects to just standard calorie restriction. Dr. Stefan Guillenet, thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, do you want to leave your website? We're going to put your website and Twitter handle in the show notes, but do you want to save them here for our audience that's just listening? Yeah, sure. My website is stephanguillenet.com. Um, and my Twitter handle is at WH source. Is that White House source? WH? <laughs> no, my blog used to be called Whole Health Source back in the day. And it's unfortunate that that's my still my Twitter handle, but it's uh, better than losing 40,000 followers. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Stefan. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 